All right, guys, we need to jump right into this. I've got a lot. It's not like necessarily a lot, but it's very, very, very deep. Um, today, we're going to actually be looking at a movie being played out in the, movie, in the Word of God this morning. And uh, it's going to be uh, the result of sin. Uh, again, you know, we're talking about the, the dead church, which is the church at Sardis. And we're going to be looking at some really deep revelation that has come forth from it. So if you all would, let's go right into it. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to just, we're going to be at verse 1 again today. Maybe we'll get to verse 2. Hoping to get to verse 2, but we'll see. I'm going to really just take my time on what the Lord has, has given me uh, up to so far. So again, Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to be at verse 1. So it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So we'll just stop right there for a minute. And so last week we talked about works. And uh, more importantly, we talked about um, works without faith. You know, we always talk about works with faith and works without faith. But last week, <clears throat> the Lord kind of hit us with um, works without faith, right? And so there is something that the Lord really began hitting me with this past week um, that I actually received in, in several different areas or avenues, if you will, I want to really share with you. So we know that the Word of God, and this really hones in on us individually, and yet, individually as a church as well, right? So you know that um, in Ephesians it says that each and every one of us was chosen by God before the foundation of the world, right? So we were chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And then Jeremiah goes into how he formed us and he ordained us and he sanctified us before he, he placed us in our mother's womb. So... Each and every one of us was given a, a design and a plan and a purpose from God himself according to the word of God before the foundation of the world was laid. So with that being said, the, way, the thing that the Lord was really sharing with me this week is this. Knowing that you have a plan and purpose from God himself that was laid before the foundation of the world, which was given to each and every one of us before that time. And we were placed upon this earth according to God's time. So the reason why we are alive and doing the things we are doing today because of God and only because of God, right? So with the plan and purpose that you have on your life right now, are you fulfilling that right now? That's what the Lord asked me this week. He said, knowing that I have given you a particular plan and a purpose and a particular design by me, myself, he said, and, and I have placed you on this earth for that particular plan and purpose to be fulfilled by you for me and my kingdom, is what he said. He said, are you doing it? And, and that, that shook me to the core because I'm like, how much of my life am I wasting? You know, and we're, I mean, we're talking about the kingdom here, but how about for families? How about your purpose in your household, your purpose in, in the society? And that's where he was kind of bringing me into the church then. Is the church living up to its plan and purpose um, to, to have an impact on society? And we as individual members of the church, we're the ones that is, is placed upon our shoulders to do so. Again, we live in a society where... People believe government is the one to, you know, to support uh, society. And the Word of God in Acts clearly says, guys, it's the church. You know, people, people will run to doctors before they run to church now. When the church is the one who really holds a great position within us, right? I mean, the, the, the spirit, the anointing of healing should be in the church, but yet we run to man for that healing. We run to man for prosperity when we know God is the one who provides for us. So it's just a little thought about how we talked about works last week, you know, works without faith. So where we're at today um, in verse 1, we're going to start looking at the part where he says, 
Um, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So, again, what I, I find amazing is, is that the name uh, in Greek, Greek, the name Greek, is the character or work of a person. So what he's saying is, you have a name, you have a character about you. You, you have a work that you're going about doing. But then he says um, that... You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So this word alive in Greek means manner of life. And dead just, in fact, means the, the body that is deprived of life. So all in all, what he's saying is you have a character and a work that you're going about, right? And you're showing that you have a manner of life that you're living by, showing that you are a Christian or that you're a member of a church. And you make people think that you're alive, but as a matter of fact, you are so dead in life. And so I began thinking about that, the, that you are dead, right? You are dead on the inside, the body deprived of life. So we know that, that God is the one that gives us life, right? And when we bring it into the body of Christ, I want you to think about this. If, if the body of Christ is dead, it means that God himself has, has removed his spirit of life from the body of Christ, that, that particular church. Now that's a scary thought, isn't it? Imagine the spirit of God not abiding amongst um, a body of believers. If we're a body of believers, or I'll just say a body, right? And we are gathered, and we think we have the Spirit of God amongst us, but yet He is not amongst us, and we will see why in just a minute. And I'll just go ahead and say because of complacency and sin. And so we are abiding in complacency and sin and not in God, so therefore He removes His Spirit from the church. And what do you call a, a church without the Spirit? A dead church. And so, yes, there are dead churches amongst us. How many churches have you known has closed the doors? I praise God that He's the one that has a plan and purpose and not man. How many times has it been said about this church that our, church, our doors will be closed? Are they? No. Is the Spirit of God alive and well up in this church? You better believe it. That's why we are few in numbers. I'll go ahead and say it. So, here it is. It says that they have a character and a work about them, and they are living a manner of life that makes it look like they are alive, but in fact, they are very, very dead. So, I want to go into a little bit further what Jesus said to the Pharisees. If you look up here, it says, Woe to you, scribes of Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, within, which indeed appear beautifully outward, but it's sad or full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that's basically what he's saying to this, this dead church right here. You're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, you appear to be beautiful on the outside. It doesn't matter how we dress, guys. We can try to dress and, 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 and put on covers of righteousness, right? Righteousness is... is Oh, i got to be careful how I say this. Righteousness is what's on the inside. You cannot cover unrighteousness. You can't, because the Lord sees through and through. And if you have the Spirit of God within you, can I tell you that you can see right through that cloak and see the unrighteousness of someone else? And so you've got to be very careful. Again, the one thing we need to really pray about this in time is that gift of discernment. You need discernment to be able to see through that cloak that a lot of people will put on you to, uh, on themselves to try to get you to be able to see the, um, something that is false, but which, in fact, when you see with the, through the discernment, you will see the truth. And so, again, I want you to see what it says up here. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says that they have a form of godliness, but denying its power. And he actually says, uh, Paul says, from such people turn away. Now, I was really blown away by this. So here is the Pharisees. Jesus is talking about Matthew, right? The Pharisees, he calls them hypocrites, right? You're dressing like you're, you're righteous and holy on the outside, but inside you're dead. And then here they have a form of godliness. So the form here in Greek actually means outward appearance. They have an outward appearance that they are holy and righteous. It means that, that they are not only how they're dressing, but how they're acting, I'm going to get in that in just a minute. They're acting all holy. They're acting all righteous. Sometimes we call this being super spiritual, right? But then it says godliness. 
Now, godliness is one of those Christianese type of words, right? We use all the time. You walk in godliness. Okay, have you ever stopped and thought about what is godliness? Because it kind of made me stop to think about this morning when I kind of went over the notes. I'm like, wait, what is godliness? You know, we use that all the time. So I looked it up in the Greek, and godliness simply means the gospel scheme. So they, they are without, they, are, they, they have a form of the godly scheme, but they are denying its power. Oh, wait a minute. They have a form of the godly scheme, right? What does that mean? What's a godly scheme? What's a scheme? A scheme is a plan. What is the gospel plan? It's the plan of salvation, right? So they have a, a plan of salvation that they are acting out. Let me share something with you. You cannot act saved, guys. You cannot act saved. If you act saved, then you're not saved. The saved will have actions of salvation. And so I was really finding this really interesting Again, he's saying you have an outward appearance of being holy. You have an outward appearance of being righteous, but yet you're dead on the inside. You have a form, you, you're acting like, you have an outward appearance that you're walking the gospel plan of salvation, but yet, as a matter of fact, the only thing you're doing is acting it out. You're not really being saved because when you are saved, again, you don't have to act like you're saved. You don't have to go tell everyone else. You're, you don't have to put the t-shirt the on and go, hey, look, I'm saved. People should be able to see it inside of you. Your, your, your tree should be producing fruits of what? Of righteousness. So I want to go a little bit deeper here. So why? Why is he telling them all that? Why are they into the, this, this plan now? Why are they walking this out like they are acting like they're saved, but they're not? What's going on here? Well, remember last week I told you all to remember that picture of the city. Remember, it was protected on all three sides of that mountain. It was like a sheer mountain cliff. Very, very smooth. And on the south side is what they really focused on. They said, we're going to get hit by the enemy at all. We're going to be invaded by the south side. We don't even have to worry about the three sides, right? And so um, they felt very secure because of the natural defenses in their area. However, they were actually captured twice. Once by Cyrus of Persia. And then later by the Romans. And do you think they, they were invaded by the south or from the south side of the city? No, guess where they were invaded at? Through the walls. Those armies were actually able to rope and repel themselves over the walls and into the city. The very thing they said, there is no way we're going to get attacked in this area. All right, so what this means, guys, is this. Their overconfidence and their complacency allow the enemy to overtake them. They did not feel challenged or threatened, and they were unaware of their spiritual condition of complacency. Again, they were very spiritually comfortable in their walk with God. Now, remember Paul said last week, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Because fear and trembling... Uh, how you view your salvation will cause you to be watchful. It will cause you to be on guard. It will cause you to stay awake. So again, as, as a question came last week, I want to ask you all something. Why are those walls in your life that you have built up, that you think are impenetrable, that the enemy cannot come through that way? Maybe it's a false sense of security. Maybe it's a false sense of, of salvation. Remember, you cannot act like you're saved and be saved. You cannot do that. And again, wow, thank you, Lord. Th look at this. But denying its power, the godly scheme, right? I've got to get back to this for a minute. Lord, just show me something. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What was the godliness again? The, the gospel scheme, the plan of salvation in your life. And it says, but denying the power of salvation in your life. When you receive salvation from the Lord, can I share something with you? you? Not only are you receiving salvation from death into eternal life, but you should be resurrecting everything in your life when you bring Jesus Christ into your life. Salvation should cover your life from, from that moment of rebirth all the way through. So any, any relationships that are laid dead, maybe it was bridges that you have burned, can I tell you the power of salvation can do some amazing miracles in your life. People that you thought you had to write off, people that you thought wrote you off, 
kind of share with you, when the power of salvation comes in your life, the miracle of life will come through in those dead situations and will birth forth life to where you thought everything that was dead will now come to life because you're allowing Jesus Christ, who is the, the miracle worker, to come in your life and bring forth life. All right, so let's get back to this. It must be noted here that Jesus did not say that they were dying. He did not say, I know your works, that you have a name, but you're, you're dying. He says you're dead. All right, It's very important we understand that. He says they are dead. So this, this tells us exactly where they were concerning their spiritual condition. He didn't say that they were dying, that, that there was still a little bit of hope for some of them. He said you're dead. Once you're dead, there's no hope. All right, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. So we got to ask ourselves, what caused this church to get in this, this death condition, the spiritually dead condition? Well, we know it's complacency, and we know it's sin. Again, complacency is having false security while being aware, unaware of the dangers. Now, I want you to sh see something up here. We're about to go extremely deep. I was kind of rushing all this because I'm so excited to get to where we're going. All right, I'll just be honest with you. I'm so excited all morning to get where we're going. This movie, I want to show you. But, but I want to talk about uh, sin for a moment. All right? Now, look at what Genesis 2.17 says. But this is what God was telling Adam and Eve. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, in Hebrew, this phrase, you shall surely die, is actually dying, you shall die. That is how it actually is worded in Hebrew. Dying, you shall die. So what God was saying is, as soon as you eat that fruit, you're not going to drop dead. What it means, you will start a slow process to death. You, as soon as you eat of that fruit, you will begin to die. But you won't immediately die. It's going to be a long process to death. Again, look at what James says. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So as soon as you begin to tangle with, with sin, you begin to die. And so, what's the result? Death. There's no hope, right? When you begin become entangled in sin, there is no hope anymore. You will die when you're in sin. Now, I want to show you... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. On the cross, Jesus defeated the power of sin. As Christians, we can no longer say the devil made me do it. You cannot justify sin in your life anymore, guys. Um, I wish I had my phone up here. The Lord gave me something the other day. You cannot justify sin at all. There is no way you can justify sin anymore in your life. The, the power of sin has been broken. At this point, as Christians, guess what? It becomes a choice. It simply becomes a choice. I know that is really steep and, and heavy to, to take on, but, but think about it. Everything you fall in is a choice. You know, Brother Chris and I were talking yesterday you know, praise God, God has done such a work inside of us out on this road. Amen, brother? Because before, I mean, we would really like to run people off this road. And as you see now, with, with the way people drive, I mean, I'm telling you what, there are some days I'm like, Lord, if you don't take a hold of this wheel, I'm about to turn this person off in this road in the ditch. Because it just, there is something that creeps up inside of you, right? It's that sinful nature that we still have as human beings that, that creeps up inside of you. And when people, you know, pass you and you're like, man, my family, my church family is, is all over this road. And some idiot is going to pass on a double line in a curve on a hill just because they're trying to get to somewhere where it's not important. Get to nowhere, as a matter of fact. And you're going to kill someone. So you know what? I'm going to take you out before you take someone else out is what comes in my mind. Now, is that sin? Well, you know, it can really start becoming sin when I start doing that. But praise God, right, that he has done such a, a mighty work inside of each and every one of us. But the thing is, what I'm trying to tell you is this. The power of me doing this is broken. For me to do this is my choice. 
And if I do that, I am no longer in the spirit of Christ. I am now in the, the flesh of David, which is a very bad area to go, which means that morning I wouldn't have gone on my cross and crucified this flesh. So let's begin to really see what this looks like being played out. I want everyone to turn to Proverbs chapter 7. We're going to go in great detail about how it looks when, when sin is conceived and how it results in death. We're going to be at Proverbs chapter 7. And there's going to be a lot of explaining right here. Uh, like I said, I was trying to like wrap it up quick in the, in the beginning because there's a lot that's going to come to life right here. And, and as we go forth, I want you to put yourself in this young man's shoes. And I will explain to you in a minute. Uh, sometimes when the Word of God describes a young man, you got to look at it deeper because a lot of times it's either man or woman. So what this story is about can either be a, actually um, a son or a daughter is what it actually means in Hebrew. All right. So just because we're, we're learning about a, a young man story does not mean that it is not um, applied to you ladies. Because as a matter of fact, it actually does. And I'll show you where it actually means sons or daughters. So chapter 7, verse 1 of Proverbs says this. My son... Keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live in my law as an apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, have you ever seen pictures of Jews? You'll see that they have what's called phylacteries um, tied around their, their fingers and it's kind of wrapped around their, their arms all the way up. And they're basically like black, black bands, maybe uh, of leather. And what it actually is, is, is reminders of the Word of God on their life. It's a way that they can remind themselves. So that's why it says here, uh, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart. You know, ever say that, that phrase, of, I need to uh, wrap a string around my, my, tie a string around my finger so I won't forget. Well, this is exactly what it's talking about. You've got to do things in your life, guys, that will keep you reminded of what the Word of God says. At home, on our fridge, we have the I am's printed out on the fridge. That way, when we you know, go to the fridge first thing in the morning, get water or whatever, we, we read, I am a child of the Most High God. I am above and not beneath. You've got to be reminded of that before you step out in this world. And so then, verse 4 says this, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, also I want to share with you right here, <clears throat> we're talking about a seductress, right? We're going to be talking about a harlot. Now, this is pertaining to the story, but again, allow the Holy Spirit to do a deeper work with inside of each and every one of us. We're, we're using the imagery of a seductress woman right here, but this woman could represent anything in your life. It could actually represent your career, your job. It could represent um, absolutely anything. So allow that to be open in your, your mind and your heart so the Lord can, can really um, minister in that way. So now let's get deep. Let's go to verse 6. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding. So... Simple here, and saw among the simple. Simple in Hebrew basically means you're easily seduced, you're gullible, um, you will accept anything. A again, this person right here, they're open-minded to the point where their brains fall out, right? They will accept anything and everything. They're so easily gullible. It says, I perceived among the use a young man. This right here is where I was saying earlier, young man actually in Hebrew actually represents either a son or a daughter. So it applies to both sexes right here. And notice I said it applies to both sexes, man or woman. That's all God created was a man or a woman. Amen? And what he created is what you are. All right, let's go. 
a young man devoid of understanding. This is where we're going to go really deep, and this is going to explain the rest of this. Please understand. So devoid of understanding re- refers to the heart. The, the actual phrase devoid of understanding in Hebrew actually means destitute of heart. When someone is destitute of heart, I will show you in a minute, it means you have no meaning in your life. For, uh, you can just go ahead and look up here. Look at Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now listen to what what the Word of God is saying to us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know wisdom is what? It's application, right? And the knowledge or the awareness of the Holy One is understanding. I was blew away this morning. The knowledge of the Holy One is very important, guys, that you go back to the original Greek and Hebrew because you will learn a lot of things. Holy One, that's probably written in your word too, something like that, is actually plural. It actually should be read Holy Ones. Not Holy One, but Holy Ones, which represents the Trinity, right? And so what that means is when, when you have an awareness of, of the Trinity in your life, it will bring understanding. In other words, it brings meaning into your life, right? When you have an awareness of who the Father is, when you have an awareness of who the Son is, Jesus Christ, and when you have an awareness of who the Holy Spirit is, I will share with you, it will begin to bring a lot more meaning into your life, knowing of how to have a relationship with each of the three into one. And so now... It says that when you begin to have awareness of the Trinity, it brings meaning into your life to where now you will apply that relationship with each of the three. And now that's the the beginning of the fear of the Lord. So when you were first saved and you had that one-on-one contact with God himself, you feel his glory come upon you. At the same time, you feel his mercy and his grace, which you could not describe with words. And now he is that all struck understanding of who God is. And he is standing before you at that moment of salvation. You had such a fear and trembling upon you, did you not? There was such a fear and an all reverence for God at that moment of salvation. But watch what happens. When, when life begins to take place. And, and now you're having a hard time understanding God in those moments of your life of despair. You can't see God, right? Now the, the meanings, uh, your situations of tragedy begin to take more meaning than God himself within those tragedies. Because God can take any tragedy and turn it into a testimony. And when you're in that moment, right, and all you see is tragedy, now you're, you're no longer having an awareness of the Trinity in your situation. So therefore, now the situation is not as meaningful as it used to be. Meaning that now your relationship with God is not as meaningful as it used to be. So this is what the Lord would share with me. He said, when meaning subsides, so does the fear of the Lord. And when the fear of the Lord subsides, then does application, which is the wisdom here that's spoken about. So then now what all this means is this. When you become destitute of heart, when there's no longer meaning in your life, even specifically of of God working in your life, what will happen is now we will begin to go out and seek to fill the void that's that's now in our heart with things of this world. I'm going to tell you this right now, and this is a 100% fact. When you are devoid of the meaning of God in your life, you will go out however you will to fill that void of meaning in your life with other things of the world. You will not try to fill it now with God, because now there is no longer an awareness of God. There's no more meaning of God in your life. So now you will go out and try to fill that void with other meanings, and any other thing would be the things of this world. And this is where it's going to get really, really deep here. When you go out trying to seek to fill that void in this world, in your heart, you will be led by the five senses of your flesh. And when you are being led by the five senses of the flesh, you will be led into temptation every single time. 
And I'm about to show you that, prove that to you in this word. So again, um, it, it said, I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a man devoid of understanding. And then it says in verse 8, Passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house. And the twilight and the evening and the black and dark night. Wasn't it the daytime he was going seeking? You will never seek in the light. Because the light is Christ, right? So if you're seeking the truth, seeking life, you will be seeking Christ. But here, every, this, this shows us every single time when we begin to, to hunt for meaning in our life, we will do it under the cloak of darkness. And under the cloak of darkness is deceit, is manipulation, and it is the, the path to temptation. Now, watch verse 10. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. So this means that, spiritually speaking, she was clothed with unrighteousness while also being subtle and cunning. This is what that crafty heart means. She was clothed with unrighteousness, and she was subtle and cunning. Where else in the Word of God do we read where somebody was subtle and cunning? It goes all the way back in the garden, where the serpent was the most cunning of all the beasts, right? Keep that in the back of your mind. And then verse 11 says, She was loud and rebellious, her feet would not stay at home. I sure wish I could preach on this whole thing because there's so much involved just with that. But look at verse 12. At times she was outside, at, town, at times in the open square, looking at every corner. So she was lurking around, what? Seeking whom she may devour. This is exactly what our adversary does. And this is what, what uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 5. Our adversary, the devil, uh, ro ro roams the earth, right, uh, roaring like a lion, seeking whom he, whom he may devour. So this is what your adversary is doing right here at this moment, seeking how he may devour you, and he will use temptation in your life to do it every single time. Because he, you know why he has to use temptation? Because the power of sin is broken. The power of sin is broken on your life. So the power of sin is no longer a weapon he can use. What he can use, according to James, is what you have. It says that we are enticed by our own desires. And that's what we are drawn away with, with our own desires. And our own desires is the door to temptation. So the only way that you can be tricked, the only way you can be played, the only way you can be led into temptation is by your own flesh. So... Now, as I said, when you are led by this way, and you're trying to seek and fill that void of meaning in your heart, what you will do, you will be led by your five senses, right? I'm going to show you all five senses in this story, beginning with verse 13. It says, So she caught him and kissed him with an, a strong face, an impudent face, a strong face. She said to him these words. Now watch. It says that she caught him and she kissed him. This is where the Lord began revealing this. The word kissed in Hebrew simply means to touch. Touch is one of the five senses of the flesh. Think about it. We got what? Touch. We got taste. We got sight. We got um, sound and, and smell. All right. It's good that we all know that. Because instead of the three-walled city, we have a five-walled city. All right, be careful, be on guard, and I will show you how these temptations really come in. You're thinking right now, well, you know, that, that middle wall right there, I'm fine. Okay, I'll show you in just a minute. So here we see the first sense of touch being used here. She kissed him. And so now look at verse 14. I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. I'm about to show you the second sense right here. Let me, let me share, let me explain this to you first. I have peace offerings. Peace offering was like a religious feast, all right? So what a peace offering would be is this. You didn't go to the Lord with a sacrifice in order to obtain peace from Him. You would go to the Lord with a sacrifice showing that you have peace with Him. So what this kind of was, was like a, a communal feast, if you will. What this, this was, was you would take that animal, the priest would sacrifice it for you, and then you would actually share the meal with the Lord. 
Again, showing not that you need peace with God, but that you have peace with God. So this was a, a, a meal that was meant to be shared with the Lord. But what did she say? I have my peace offerings and I pay my, I have peace offerings with me. In other words, I'm not sharing my peace offering with the Lord while I'm supposed to be doing. I got some good stuff. I, I, I've created a great dinner. You know what this is? Self-indulgence for one thing. Supposed to, what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing with the Lord, you're actually using it for your own good uh, worship. But this is another thing. This is the sense of taste. Again, I have peace offerings. I have a sacrificial meal with me that we can share. Not that I can share with the Lord, but I can share with you. This is a sense of taste. Now, did this brother actually partake of that meal right now? No. But let me share something with you. Remember, again, back at the garden, it said that the tree was, that Eve looked at the tree and she saw it was good for food. She could taste it, right? All right, let me, let me, let me ask you this. You ever be on like a, a couple of day fast, complete fast, and you're, you're, you're doing good, right? And you sit down and it, I guarantee it, it'll only take five minutes. You turn that TV on. In five minutes, you will see the most delicious, sloppiest hamburger come across that screen. They will throw up there a, a beautiful rack of ribs where you can see the, the sticky barbecue just sticking to it. You can, can you taste it? You can taste that thing, right? You can taste the, the hamburger. You can taste the barbecue. On your, oh, you start drooling, don't you, Miss Carol? You start drooling, right? Let me share something. I, I'm going to put myself under the bus. I don't care. This is what happened to us when we was in Melbourne. We were planting the church, and we were on a three-day fast, all right? And at the end of this, this three-day fast, it was actually on a Wednesday. And, of course, we had started at midnight, like Sunday or whatever it was. And it was a total fast. And uh, I was talking, we had some elders visit from another church that night, and I was talking to the brother, and uh, we were talking about fast, how powerful they are and how awesome a fast is and all this and that. And so, man, we had a great service that night. Worship was good. The word was good. And I was way up on cloud nine, right? I feel good. I was like, man, we, we did this fast. It was awesome. I sit down about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and I, I do the worst thing. I turn that TV on. And I, man, some, you know, some images are burned into your mind. It's, it's why they call it a negative right? It has a negative effect on you. I still remember that commercial to this day. It was a local Chinese buffet restaurant that, that put their advertisement up, and it showed a close-up of fried rice steaming, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I justified 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. We started at 12, but you know what? I mean, God loves me. In 15 minutes, I was in the, uh, in the kitchen making fried rice. <laughs> and that's after having an amazing service. I had two hours to go, guys. And as soon as I turned that TV on, I fell. Because that fried rice looked so good. And my stomach said, okay, fat boy, it's time to eat. You know what I'm saying? So, again, just because you haven't partaken of it does not mean that that, that sense of taste is not active. You could taste that thing. You ever have a smell that just kind of brings a memory back to you? We'll talk about that in just a minute. So here it is. A again, what we're talking about here, the, the sense of taste. There's two now, right? Sense of touch, the sense of taste. So now let's, let's go a little bit more. Verse 15. <clears throat> it says, So I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, I have found you. Roaring around, or roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking to whom he may devour, he has found him. It is time to devour this poor young man. 16. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. This is our third one, sense of sight. It was luxuriously appealing with all these colored coverings of Egyptian linen. It made her look pretty rich, pretty luxurious. And, and this was a third temptation of him. All right, she, she's got it going on, right? She is maybe well-established. 
if you will. So, verse 17. Very interesting. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Now, i got to be kind of careful here. We have some young ears. But myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon, I just learned a little while ago, was an aphrodisiac. You will actually find it in the Song of Solomon. So here she is creating an aphrodisiac for the what? Fourth sense, which is smell. Smell can have a tremendous um, impact on your life, right? Again, like I said, when you smell different things, it brings back memories, right? Well, what I find also interesting is this. Not only are those three spices um, for an aphrodisiac, it's also... Um, was used for embalming. So not only was it used for an aphrodisiac, but it was also used to embalm bodies with. So a, in other words, it was, it was used to anoint the dead. So she used an aphrodisiac as the snare to, to trick him and ensnare him. That's what it means to be um, enslaved, to, to sin, to be entrapped, Right? So she entrapped him with the aphrodisiac smell, but yet it was for the, um, uh, the anointing to embalm his dead body. You've got to be careful. And again, what we're talking about, the fourth sense smell. So now we've seen touch, we've seen taste, we've seen sight, and we've seen smell. Um, all right, verse 18. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. So this word love is actually the oldest Hebraic word for love. It's not, um, uh, sorry, I just bum up the Greek word for love. Agapio. It doesn't mean agape, unconditional love. It doesn't mean agapio. It doesn't mean philo, it doesn't mean brotherly love, but what it actually means is to boil. This is a Hebrew word, dode, and it actually means to boil. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. In other words, let us boil over with emotion and passion, is what this word actually means. Let us delight ourselves with love. This word love right here actually means to thresh with affection. To thresh with affection. So what she is saying is, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go that route. All right. As for the med- for the uh, uh, marriage bed, which is undefiled, this is a beautiful picture. That's all I can really say about it right now. All right. It is absolutely good. In God's eyes. Outside the marriage bed, this is definitely not good in the eyes of God. And have you ever, well, no, you don't watch Skinamax. Of course you don't, because we're Christians. But if you would actually watch Skinamax, every single couple on there is probably not married. And every single scene is like what we just read right there. Passionate love, boiling over for one another. Let us delight ourselves with this love, right? Now, Think about this. Do you think this young man is playing this picture in his mind as she's speaking this? You better believe it. This is back to the third sense of sight. Again, spiritually speaking, this is not actually going on, but as she is speaking it, this young man is seeing it. And that is one of the worst temptations for any man or woman. When you can actually see that movie being played out in your mind, it's like it's actually happening. I want you to think back to Elijah for a minute. When he, would, he just slayed 450 prophets of Baal. And Jezebel sent a messenger and she said, Tell him that what he did to my prophets, I'm going to do to him and even worse. And the word of God clearly says, The messenger spoke these things to Elijah. The very next scripture says, And when he saw it. Look it up. He spoke it, the messenger spoke it. But Elijah saw it. He could see it play out in his mind. What caused him to do what happened then after that? It caused him to run in fear. 
And he hid in the cave, all because not what he heard, but what he saw. You've got to be careful. You protect this thing up here, guys. This thing up here will rule your life, and it will ruin your life. So the enemy will try to come, and the only thing he's got to do is speak a little thing. And you will see that movie being played out, just like this young man right here. He could see this passionate love movie playing out in his mind, and now she just got him with four senses right there. She, she's leading him now with four of the temptations, if you will. Now let's watch verse 19. Who does this sound like? For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. I'm not talking about an individual. Who does that sound like? My husband has been gone on a long journey. Whose husband, spiritually speaking, is on a long journey right now, gone, but will be coming back soon? How often is this seductress woman the church? Think about that for a moment. Here we thought about a, a you know, a, a woman who is all, all into sin, has nothing to do with God whatsoever. But spiritually speaking, this could actually, by all means, be the church. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. We can live anywhere we want right now because I'm under the, the cloak of grace. We're going to have our fun. And before he comes back, we can repent and we'll be all good to go. As a matter of fact, remember he was, <laughs> he was walking in verse 9 in the darkness. This poor man didn't even have his lantern with him. The path to her house was not lit with a lamp. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet, a light to the path, right? So both of these are complete darkness. They're walking complete darkness. Use discernment. All right, so let's finish this up. Verse 20. He has taken a bag of money with him, ransom, and will come home on the appointed day. Verse 21. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Fifth sense, hearing. She knocked him down with, with what? Touch, and then into taste, and then to sight. As she hit that s smell, and then she went back and hit that um, sight again. And then now she hit him with the hearing. And it was at this moment, the fifth sense, he fell. And so that uh, caused him to yield, which therefore, in verse 22, immediately. Now remember, what did she say back in verse 18? Come, let us take her fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. That passionate, emotional overflowing that boiled within him. Turn into verse 22. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Real quick, let me share with you about the liver. You would think it, it would strike his heart, right? But in the Old Testament, the, the liver actually in, in Hebrew represents honor and glory. When that sin fully conceives in you and brings forth death, what happens is it strikes your honor. As a matter of fact, it destroys your honor. A man or woman who is in sin, who falls to sin, it destroys their character, it destroys their honor. But even more importantly, it also represents glory. When you are in full sin, God will remove His glory from you. And how you know this? Ezekiel, you don't have to turn there. We're, we're almost done, but there's so much right here. But in Ezekiel 10, it's a story about how God removed his glory from the temple because of the abominations the Israelite nation was doing. He himself removed his glory from the temple. Who is the temple of God now? When you abide in sin, God will remove his glory from you. Now, what else I thought was really neat was this. Till an arrow struck his liver. Now, we know to sin 
is an archery word meaning to miss the mark. So when we say that we sin, what we mean is we miss the mark. Again, it's an archery term. And, of course, the mark is Jesus Christ. So when we sin, we miss the mark of Christ, right? But here is a beautiful picture, unfortunately, of what happens uh, with sin itself. It shows that when sin has you in its sights and you play with sin every single time, it will hit its mark. Again, it takes out your honor and it will cause the glory of God to be removed out of your life. So finally, verse 24. It says, Now therefore listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. And this is the most important, verse 26. For she has cast down many wounded, meaning polluted, and all who were slain by her were strong men. All who were slain by her were strong, mighty men. Not impotent men, not weak men, not simple men. They were strong of the strong. Make sure you understand that. Again, we're talking about men and women here, guys. Sons and daughters of God. Again, it says they were strong. They were strong in the Lord. How many leaders have you, have you seen or heard fall to sin? They were strong in the Lord. But unfortunately, when that happens, the church ends up kicking them the rest of the way down. Instead of being who we're supposed to be and helping them back up, brush off the dust. Because you know what? We are one step away from falling ourselves. No matter how strong you are, you cannot be super spiritual in your walk with God. You've got to know it. it's not your walk anyway. It's, it's the grace of God upon your life. It's His grace and His mercy that He has given each and every one of us. Because if we boast about our own walk, then we are boasting about our own works. And if that's the case, then you are not saved, because you are only saved by grace through faith, not by our own works. And finally, verse 27, Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Hell, again, in uh, Hebrew, is Sheol. It's a place of the dead. I wanted to get a couple, a little bit further, but, but as you see, we're, we're out of time. But anyway, that's what I want to share with you. This is the movie that has played out with this church of Sardis. And we know as a church, as a body of Christ, is an individual effort on their part to become dead. And what I mean by that is this. A lot of times it'll be what's being preached behind the pulpit is spoken death. We know that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Again, it's interesting to me that death is mentioned first in life because we mostly speak death before we speak life. And when we see one another fall, there is no reason for us to beat each other while we're down. It is up to us to help each other up. As a matter of fact, you know what a, a true Christian would do? I know this is unheard of, but if you see your brother or sister fall, you help them get back up, you dust them off, even you know wash their feet. And this is the key. And this is the unheard of part. You don't tell nobody about it. Because honestly, how can you wash someone else when you yourself are in it? It's only the Word of God that can wash someone. All right? So what we've got to understand, guys, is this. The reason why the church of Sardis is in the place that it's in, number one, no one was willing to step up and go, hey, you know what? What you are doing is, is not good. It's leading to temptation. It's leading to sin, which leads to death. And then now they were like a bunch of lemmings following one another behind leadership, right? And all of them were leading to death. And they, they felt, you know, complacent. They felt a false sense of security. And they were acting saved when, in fact, they were not. So as we go out this week and prepare for the last part of this, maybe the last part of this message, what I want to ask you and what we all need to do is this. Look in our hearts, go before the Lord, see if there's any wicked ways in us. What, what areas have we built up a false security in, in our lives? What areas are we acting saved in when we're actually not saved? It's very important because, we're, remember, this is Jesus speaking to the church. This, I'll, I'll close with this thought. This past week, I was asking the Lord, um, I said, you know, again, Lord, I know that you are having me bring forth these pretty deep, messages and stuff and it's not really fluffy and i was like you know 
should I be speaking a fluffy message? And simply he asked me this, did I? That was his, his question to me. Did I speak a, a fluffy message? I mean, even think about the, the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are going through persecution. Does that sound fun? No. Think about Peter. When, when, when he had boldness, right? Praise God for boldness, right? What, was it a fluffy message? You're the one that crucified Christ. What was the result of that? They were cut to the core and repented and got saved. It's not by fluffy messages, guys, that we can get saved. It's God cut us to the core. 